Hi everyone, my name is Kenzie Dodds. I am going to talk with you about React Hooks Pitfalls. I gave it the subtitle, The Hooks Honeymoon Phase is Over, because I assumed by now that the Hooks Honeymoon Phase would be over, but it's not. <laughs> I'm still enamored with Hooks, and actually somebody mentioned to me that they haven't even had a chance to try Hooks yet, so the honeymoon hasn't even started. So um, wherever you are at your current stage in using Hooks, um, eventually the honeymoon phase will probably be over, and there absolutely are things that make Hooks difficult when you're starting to get into them, and we're going to be talking about some of those things and how you can avoid those things. Um, so you can find a link to my slides right here. It's just on my GitHub, React Hooks Pitfalls, and there are links to a bunch of other things that I'm not going to belabor you with right now. So I'd like to invite everybody to please stand up. Yes! Okay, I, I forgot, I should have gotten the law of action after all, but I'm gonna just say this really loud. We're gonna do air squats just like yesterday, except we're gonna do 12 just because that's what I do. Um, so you put your arms out in front of you like this, you squat down, come back up. That's an air squat. That was just a practice. So, yes, thank you. And I want you to count out loud with me because it's more fun that way. Okay, ready? One, two, doing so good! Five, six, seven, eight. We're so close. Nine, ten. Let's do it again. One, two, All right, before you sit down, before you sit down, I want you to stretch up over your head as high as you can and stretch over to one side and over to the other. All right. Thank you very much. Yes. Woo! Okay, so I don't do that just to make you look funny or whatever. Um, I legitimately feel like your brain works better when there's blood flowing, and right after lunch it just isn't. So um, that is to help you um, be able to learn better. And also, um, I, I get super, super stressed and nervous before a talk. Like, I'm not joking. Um, so that really helps <laughs> when I just make everybody do our squats. Um, okay, just really quick. How many of you grabbed one of these stickers? Yeah, right? Cool stickers, right? So you're going to take that tiger home to Annie because she loves tigers and stuff. I just thought I'd explain what these are. <laughs> so maybe you'll put it on your laptop instead. Or give it to Annie, it's fine. Uh, this is testingjavascript.com. Uh, it's a, a course that I have. This is React Testing Library. This is DOM Testing Library. This is a podcast I just started called Chats with Kent. I'm working on season two right now. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is Jest DOM, so a, a DOM assertions for Jest. This is React Native Testing Library and Cypress Testing Library. And there are actually a whole bunch of others that I didn't bring stickers for. So we've got Vue and Re Angular and Jest Native, uh, Svelte. Yeah, that's, that's pretty cool, right? And uh, Test Cafe. So yeah, lots of cool things in the testing library family of tools. We've even got Puppeteer and all kinds. Um, and it's just super awesome. But I thought I'd just mention to you what all those are so that you, <laughs> you know what these animals are all about. Uh, okay, I like to start my talks out with some expectations so you can decide right now whether you want to be on Twitter. Um, so we're going to be exploring some common mistakes that people make when they're learning and adopting React hooks. And hopefully uh, the, the goal here is to make you better at doing so, at using React hooks. My express goal is not to make you want to use hooks or not want to use hooks, um, but hopefully you want to use hooks after this, because hooks are just awesome. I, I think they're just so fantastic. Um, and here are some questions I don't want to hear. Um, so <laughs> I hear them every time. Uh, okay, pitfall number one, starting without a good foundation. I get a lot of questions on Twitter, and I'm super happy to answer these questions. 90% uh, of the questions that I get on Twitter will be answered if people read the docs, and especially if uh, they read the fact. You know, like some of these questions are so common, you might think that they're frequently asked. Um, and so, not, not to begrudge anybody asking me questions, I, I'm happy uh, to answer when I can, um, but there is so much good information in the, the documentation. And if you've read it already, like six months ago when Hooks came out, you're like, sweet. Uh, they've changed. They keep on iterating on these, making them better, so read them again. That is just, I see this all the time, people just kind of jump into it, and that's totally cool. Jump into it, learn it the way you want to learn it, but at some point, go and read the docs, 
because uh, they are good. Um, and then there's also some additional material that you can get into to kind of help fill in some of those gaps for you. And the more that you, you practice this stuff, like actually build stuff, you're going to get better at it as well. You just kind of develop an intuition over time. Um, but I do have some egghead stuff that you can go uh, look at. The first one here is free, and this one is for members only. Um, I do workshops, and other instructors have online stuff too. So take advantage of those resources. There are more all the time. Uh, and I'm working on a really big thing for React as well, so if you want to be notified of that, you can subscribe to my newsletter. But in any case, my, what I, this first pitfall, the recommendation here is to read the docs and the frequently asked questions, and then you can ask the infrequently asked questions, and then maybe eventually those will get in the docs too. You can make a pull request and put it in yourself. That would be awesome. All right, pitfall number two, not using or ignoring the ESLint plugin. Um, so, this ESLint plugin, it's um, the official plugin built by the React team. What I like to think of the ESLint plugin, React Hooks uh, plugin, is it's like I have Dan Abramoff standing right next to me when I'm coding, and I write something, and a little warning comes up, and that's Dan leaning over and saying, Kent, you're using hooks wrong. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, you're right. Let me, and, and then I can like do command dot, and it says fix this, and it's like, and Dan's like, here, scoot over. <laughs> That's, that's what the ESLint plugin is. <laughs> okay, thank you, Dan. Um, of course, it's not just Dan, there are contributors as well. Um, but uh, there are two rules that come with this uh, plugin set. So the first is rules of hooks, and the second is exhaustive depths. So the rules of hooks is set to, they, they recommend you set that as an error. And the reason for that is because it's really easy to catch violations of this rule. Uh, of this problem, and so like 99% of the time if you're violating this rule, uh, then it's a problem. You need to change your code or you'll experience bugs. Um, for exhaustive depths, that's set to a warn, and still like 90% of the time you're breaking this rule, you're probably going to experience bugs, um, but due to the limitations of static code analysis tools like ESLint, it can't quite get you there, and so that's why, they, I, at least this is what I'm assuming, that's why they um, set that to be a warn. So let me just give you a quick rundown of, of what these rules do. There are a bunch of rules of hooks, and one of them is um, you can't conditionally call a hook uh, because hooks must be called in the exact same order every component render. Uh, and so you'll get a warning for this, and that one's just really easy to fix. You just you know move it out. Don't, don't worry about it. Or if, if you really want to make it conditional, you can put it in a different component and conditionally render that component, and it works fine. Um, so there, there are actually several ways you can violate that rule. Pretty much every time, fix it. Exhaustive depths is a little bit more tricky, but it has to do with this array, uh, the dependency array that you have on the use effect hook, use memo, and use callback, and use layout effect. Um, and in this instance, we're using this bar function, but we're not putting that in our dependency array. And so what happens if, is if that bar function ever changes, then that side effect is now um, out, out of sync with the uh, state changes that are going on. So I'm, this one's a little bit trickier to, um, to really grasp why this could ever be a problem or why this is even necessary. So I've got a demo for this, but there are lots of situations where you can break this rule, and um, I'm only going to show one that I've seen quite a bit of people breaking this rule and, um, and not knowing why they should just not ignore it. So here we've got dogs and dependencies. Um, so we have three versions of the same app, hidden bug, revealed bug, and fixed bug, or fixed version. Um, and you can click on one of these, and it shows you information about that particular dog. And um, we'll just go straight to the Bernadoodle, because that's the best one. Yeah. Bernadoodles are great, because they don't shed, because they're poodle. And they're also smart, because they're a poodle. But then they're like super loving and loyal, because they're Bernies. Yeah, they're great. That's my dog. So. Um, that actually is not a picture of my dog, though. <laughs> my bad. I just found a random picture of some random dog. <laughs> um, okay, so here's the, um, our first version here, where we're coding up, and we have our dog info here. So this is the info page that you see right here. And when we first load this page, we only have the dog ID, and that's coming from the URL. Thank you, React Router. Thank you, Ryan Florence and Michael Jackson and other contributors. Um, so I'm getting that dog ID. Um, oh, actually, it's Reach Router, but, you know, um, <laughs> same thing. Uh, one day, it'll all be the same, it'll be great. So um, here we're using an effect to get the dog information once we mount this component uh, based on that dog ID. 
And then as we were writing this, we got this little warning that said, hey, uh, you're missing the dependency dog ID. You either need to include it or remove the dependency array. And so remember, that's, that's Dan leaning over and saying, hey, hey, you're using hooks wrong. And so this is what I'm going to do. I'm just going to uh, ignore it. And I'm going to say, hey, Dan, I know hooks better than you do. That's what I'm doing when I ignore the islint rule. Um, so don't, don't, don't do that most of the time. Um, have a conversation with them. Be like, no, really, I, you know, let's talk about it. So it, it's working fine, though. And that's the thing. Like you, uh, you add that ignore, and you play around with it, and you're like, no, it's totally fine. There's, there's no way that this dog ID could ever change, because I'm going to leave the dog page, and I'm going to go to another dog page, and it works fine. OK, so we feel like we're fine. But then somebody comes around, and here we'll go to the reveal bug. Now we're going to have a new feature where each dog has a related dog section here. And so if I go to the Bernadoodle, then that'll show me the uh, Poodle and Bernie's are related uh, dogs. OK, so now I actually am going to have a problem. I want you to look at the URL right here. And when I click on Poodle, you'll notice it changes, but I'm not re-rendering my component, right? So what's going on here? So is, is reach router busted because it's not re-rendering? The URL changed, but it's not re What's going on? Actually, what's happening is it is re-rendering. But my side effect is now out of sync with, um, with the state of my app. And so that is why the, the dependency array is so important. And we're going to talk about this in a second. But it's that side effect being out of sync with the state of the app. And so like the, <laughs> the solution to this is pretty easy. You just put the dog ID in there like Dan told you to in the first place. And, and it works fine. And so now I can go to Bernadoodle and go to Bernie's. And yeah, and it works great. Um, and I wouldn't bring up this example if I didn't see this a lot. A lot of people are like, well, no, it, I only want it on mount. And that actually leads us into our, our uh, next pitfall. But just to wrap this one up, wrong way, um, install, use, and follow the Islint plugin. And 99% of the time, if you're breaking the Islint plugin, you can make your app more bug free by uh, rewriting your code so that you don't have to break that plugin, uh, that, that rule. OK, pitfall number three. Thinking in life cycles. So I think that learning hooks is harder if you've been using React since before hooks. I'm getting a head nod, yeah? Yeah, it is. It is harder because you have to kind of forget life cycles and forget about the component life cycle, mounting, updating, unmounting. And instead, you shift to uh, effect synchronization. So let's just take a look at uh, an example. This dog info is a little bit more fleshed out, because now if the dog ID changes mid-flight of that request, we're going to abort the previous one. right? So we've just made this a little bit better. Uh, so that's where this abort controller is coming from. Um, other than that, it's pretty much the same, where we just fetch the dog based off of the dog ID. And then we have our mounting. We want to fetch a dog when it mounts, right, initially. And then if it ever updates and the dog ID is the thing that changed, then we'll uh, fetch the dog again. And if it unmounts, then we need to uh, abort the previous uh, request so that we don't get that warning that says, hey, cannot set state on an unmounted component. Yeah, raise your hand if you've seen that. That's annoying. Um, thank you, promises, for not being cancelable. Um, and then we have to use this abort controller nonsense. Uh, should all just use our X? Um, <laughs> so if we were to take this class component and just straight up refactor it to hooks and still think about life cycles, then this is what it would look like. And, and I, I show you this because I've seen people do this. Maybe you've done this before. Um, and so this is something you need to be cognizant of. So first off, the controller is now a use ref. And that's because with classes, you have instance properties. Uh, a property on the instance of the component. Functions don't have instances. You, you don't have an instance of a function component, and so therefore you can't use this anywhere. And so instead, you're going to use a ref. So that's where the use ref stuff comes from. Then we've got our use state. And then we just pretty much move the fetch dog down and re, uh, move things around so we don't use this anymore. So controller ref dot current now. Um, and instead of this dot props dot dog, dog ID, it's just dog ID, that kind of thing. And then we're going to make effects for each one of those life cycles. Kind of makes sense. So we have a did mount. And with that, we need to do the empty array. And we're like, no, Dan, I, I know hooks. Um, and we do the uh, fetch dog on mount. And then on update, uh, React actually doesn't come shipped with a use update hook. And there's a, a totally good reason for this. And it's because you're not supposed to be thinking about your component lifecycle 
uh, with your effects, you're supposed to be doing it uh, or thinking about state synchronization. That said, you can build this uh, use update, but I wouldn't recommend building a use update hook for two reasons. One, there's actually like 12 on NPM already. Um, <laughs> and, and two, um, you can typically, if you're doing something like this, then there's probably something else that's a, a bit of a problem. I lied, there are three. Um, it, you'll probably want to have a, dependent, a dependency array, um, and you couldn't, uh, the linting plugin can't check that for you either. So we also have this use previous, which is like a three line hook. It's pretty simple to write. You can go look that up. Um, but yeah, so we base the previous dog ID, check the new dog ID, and if, they're, if that's changed, then we'll fetch the, fetch the dog. And then on unmount, we just return a function that does our cleanup. Okay, cool. All right. So I look at this and I'm like, why do we need hooks? Like, if, if this is how we were writing hooks, I would look at this and say, you know what, classes are easier, let's just use classes. And I think actually a lot of people feel that way. Uh, they, they see uh, stuff like this and they don't understand how this is any better than classes. And I agree with them, this is not a whole lot better than classes. But that's because we haven't changed our mindset from life cycles to, um, um, to state synchronization and, and uh, side effect synchronization. So if we were to write this thinking about synchronizing the state of the world with the state of the component, then this is what it would look like. All on one slide, slide, right? So we have our dog info, we have the dog ID, uh, we have our state, we no longer need ref because that's all happening in this one effect. So everything that is associated to the side effect, the, the change in the state of the world that we need to make based on the state of our application. It all is self-contained in this single callback function. So anytime this dog ID changes, well yeah, we need to abort the previous request if there's one in flight, and we need to make a new one. And, uh, and so it can all be self-contained. And the cool thing about this, and this is where hooks get really, really awesome, is if I wanted to take this same code and share it across other components, I literally just make a function and move it up into that function, then I call that function, like custom hooks. Holy shnikes. So awesome. So I, I just love this. And if you can ch kind of change the way that you think about hooks and instead think about, uh, or, or sorry, change the way you think about component life cycles and instead think about synchronizing the state of the world with the changes that are happening in your application, then you'll have a much easier time. I would say this is probably the most important uh, thing to master so that you can be effective using hooks. So uh, Ryan Florence, he, uh, uh, tweeted this a while back. I love this tweet, even with the typo. The question is not, when does this effect run? The question is, with which state does this effect synchronize? And so here, if you use use effect with no dependencies, that's the default, then it synchronizes with all state. And the thing that I, all state? <laughs> um, I, I just, yeah. Um, so, are you in good hands? Um, <laughs> sorry. So the, um, the default is now every single render your effect is going to run. And if your effect is item potent, which is a long word that I'm, I don't understand, um, just look it up on Wikipedia. But if it is that, if it's doing a good job of cleaning itself up and, and setting up the state uh, or the effects properly, then actually this is, this is fine. Like you won't experience bugs is the key. You might experience poor form performance problems and maybe like really serious performance problems, but your side effects will remain in state, uh, remain in sync with your uh, application state, which is the, the key. Um, if you do an, an empty array, then that's no state uh, that this side effect synchronizes with. And then uh, the, these states, so anything in there, are the states that your side effect needs to synchronize with. So that's the way you should be thinking about this. And so that's why I say, think about synchronizing side effects to state rather than, uh, than lifecycle methods. And thanks, Ryan. Uh, okay, so pitfall number four, overthinking performance. So I've seen a lot of teams mandate use callback and uh, use memo, so that's what this is all about. So here we have a function. We're, we're, we've got this yo-yo app, and we're gonna display information about different yo-yos. So we're gonna get the yo-yo um, from context, and we're gonna dispatch things, and. And we have this function handle update that we're gonna forward on to our yo-yo info component. And some people will look at this and say, oh no, that's like really bad, right? Because every single time we render, 
we're going to be updating the handle update function. But then, like literally nothing about this needs to be updated. It's the same every single time, um, like what it's supposed to do. And so we're just wastefully making a new function every render. And if yo-yo info happens to be a pure component or implements react.memo, then that's going to break that. And so we're not going to get the benefits of, of performance optimization here. So what we do is we use React use callback, which is a, basically an escape hatch to avoid that problem. Uh, and so now we can rest assured that this is going to be consistent most of the time um, through the lifetime of this component, which is great. Uh, and uh, another situation where this is good to use is if you're going to pass that function into a dependency list, which needs to be consistent, then that's also quite important. Um, but like. This is actually incurring a, com a cost in complexity in your code. Um, and, and here, not only are we not getting the benefit of not defining a function every time, because we are, uh, we're still defining that function every time, we're actually also calling a function. Uh, so if you're like super worried about performance, this is actually worse just by default. Um, and you really have to be getting a serious benefit of, of memoizing the yo-yo info to, to incur the benefit of using React use callback. We're also d defining an, an array here. So it's not going to be inherently faster. There has to be another reason that you're using this thing. Um, but again, it also has added complexity because now you have a dependency array to manage. Okay. So my takeaway here is that like, it's really important to be considerate of performance. Like, think about that. Don't just ignore performance. There are people who are using devices that are like a fraction of the um, speed that your you know, dev machine is. Uh, so be considerate of those people. But also be considerate of your code complexity, because if your code is complex, then you can't get those people the great new features that they're looking for. You're spending all your time dealing with the complexity of your code. So it's, it doesn't come for free. Um, and I have a blog post that goes in deeper on this. Use memo and use, use callback. You can find that on my blog. But uh, to avoid this pitfall, profile your app and then optimize it. So our last pitfall is number five here. Testing implementation details. It wouldn't be a Kensi dot stock without talking about testing. I'm sorry. Um, to be perfectly honest, I don't know how I became a testing guy. Uh, it just kind of happened. I never planned on it. I just started testing my code and developed opinions, and then all of a sudden, I have a course. Um, it took a little bit more work than that, but uh, okay. So. Um, testing implementation details has always been a problem. It's not actually related to hooks, but um, you ran into this problem when you started refactoring your components from class components to hooks. And you're like, oh, my tests aren't doing me any good now. I have to uh, rewrite my tests. So here we have this uh, accordion component that we're testing. We're using enzyme mount here, and we want to make sure that the set open index uh, method is going to set the open index state properly. And so this is a, a really typical test uh, that I see all the time where we mount our accordion. We say, hey, wrapper, give me your state for open index. And I'm going to make sure that starts out as 0. Then I'm going to grab the wrapper instance. So that's going to give me the instance of the accordion. I'll call the set open index method on that uh, with 1, and then make sure that the state updates to be that 1. Right? So I make sure that the set open index method works properly. Uh, do you know how many people in the world care that your method is called set open index? Absolutely none, nobody. Like you as the developer of the component, yeah, maybe. But anybody who's using your component, the developer or the end user, they don't care. That's what it's called. And so you're uh, you're giving your you're pretty much only giving yourself confidence that you've written your code the way that you wrote your code. Um, it's it's not giving you a whole lot of value. On top of that. Um, hooks are an implementation detail. And so if you're testing your code with implementation details like this, and then you change the implementation, well, now those details have changed, and therefore your tests need to change as well. And so part of the benefit of tests is that you can refactor with confidence. And a refactor is basically you, you change things, but uh, you change the implementation, but don't change the way that it works. So people who are using your component can upgrade for free, for example. Uh, or, or the end user who is also using your component, they don't need to change their behavior. And so when you refactor, your test should say, hey, it still works the same way it did, did before. That's part of the confidence that it's giving you, is that you can change the code without actually breaking any behavior. And so um, what I recommend is lots of you are probably still, uh, you still have classes in your code bases. Actually, curious, really quick, how many people only have hooks in their code bases? Woo, lucky. Yeah. Okay. So we're 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 making our way that direction. Um, 
But my recommendation is that you write tests that will work whether you're using classes or hooks. And so you can do this today, even before you can upgrade to hooks, and start just writing all of your tests free of implementation detail, and then you can upgrade to hooks, and your, your refactor to hooks uh, can be validated by the tests that you've written for your classes. Okay, so if we were to do that for our accordion, we're going to make a couple fake items, because that's what the user is going to be interacting with, is, are these items. And then we're going to use React Testing Library, because like, what else would I use? And um, here we're going to render the accordion with those items. We'll get the query by text to make sure that the hat contents are in the document, but the footwear contents are not, right? Because the hat is the first one, should be open by default. Uh, at least that's part of what we're asserting here. Uh, and then we're going to click on the footwear and then assert the inverse. And this uh, will work whether it's classes or hooks, and so you get some confidence when you do that refactor to hooks. So this is a thing that I said a while ago, and I stand by it. The more your tests resemble the way your software is used, the more confidence they can give you. And I, yeah, I feel really strongly about that. So I've got a lot of uh, blog posts and things, uh, resources you can dive deeper into uh, testing in general, way more than what I have on this slide. So you can check out my blog for more. And if you really want to level up your game on testing, testingjavascript.com is everything I know about testing. Um, which is a non-trivial amount. So check that out. So the takeaway here for avoiding this last pitfall is avoid testing implementation details. And you will be a lot happier as a result. So in review, to avoid the first pitfall, read the docs and the frequently asked questions. Feel free to ask frequently asked questions. That's why they're frequently asked. They wouldn't be frequently asked if it weren't for you, so thank you. Um, <laughs> but read, read the docs. Install, use, and follow the ESLint plugin. For real, like Dan kind of knows hooks. Think about synchronizing side effects to state rather than life cycles. Profile your app and then optimize it and avoid testing implementation details. That's all I have for you. Thanks, React Rally. I love this conference so much. <laughs> <laughs>